conversations with potential Hispanic people about what it is that you do as an undergraduate and what it is that gives you the right to come to or teaches you to come to Oklahoma State for that purpose. These, these are things going back more older than the Gilded Age, which is the period of teaching from 500 to 600, and then the Roman Civil War. So the Alex Haley Bear has been around. Al Gibbs is known by Julius Marshall and a lot of people like him. Sports as a business in universities. Yeah. Um, so I don't have uh, slides or anything. I, my excuse for this just has to be this a couple days ago. <laughs> but I've spent a lot of the past four years thinking a lot about the role of athletics and our intercollegiate athletics department and its mission and in our university's life. Um, just to give you some background, the, the intercollegiate athletics committee, which I'm not the chair at the moment, um, but I have been chair. Is, uh, is a committee which reports to the Senate. It's comprised of faculty and students. It's an advisory uh, committee. It's really about making sure the uh, mission of the university is really reflected in the athletic department's actions. And um, it's an interesting one. It's, the athletics department is, is very different. I've also, for example, chaired the university library committee. And, and the experience there is, you know, you, you learn some things. You learn some things about the publishing business. You don't realize, oh, wait, you know. So here's a bit of trivia. When we, um, uh, when we pay for our library subscriptions, we're actually subsidizing those chemists when they have conferences, wherever they have conferences, because their societies pay, uh, charge a lot for their journals. So you, you learn little tid <laughs> tidbits about how different things work. But it's still, you know, it's the library. We all use the library in some ways. We're all familiar with it in our academic work. And so you learn, but you're kind of up the learning curve already. Athletics is a whole different animal. And you know we're in a point now where especially this summer and with the 24-hour news cycle in which th so many things get covered and, and people are starting to say, you know, why should we have intercollegiate athletics at all as an amateur thing? Why don't we just spin off the athletic department and, have an affiliated football team maybe that's, you know, don't require those guys to go to, 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 to be students and, and things like that. And I think, so I, I, I agreed to be on this panel because I think it's in part a chance to, to explain um, from my point of view, working with the athletics department for four years, how, how they are an essential part of, of the campus. And I mean, a lot of people, I come at this in part uh, because I was an NCAA athlete myself. Division III, MIT, we were actually pretty good. We, uh, we got second at nationals my freshman year. Um, I was not a part of the scoring contingent at nationals, but, um, but I was there supporting the team. Um, at MIT, it's Division III, but it is about, for some of us, is another way, um, it's kind of in the culture of excellence of the campus. Um, but you, then you might ask, OK, so, so it's all well and good. Uh, just about every college has sports. Why have this large business? Why have essentially something that, that, if you look at it, operates a lot like, not exactly like, some professional um, sporting, clubs, sporting clubs? And um, I mean, the, I think the main answer is to, to be able to pay the bills for some of the highest levels of athletic <laughs> achievement we, we have. Um, in, uh, if the, you're probably a little bit young to remember, but I think it was back in 96, uh, maybe it was 92, 96, um, there was this uh, 
deal where Home Depot would sponsor a uh, few Olympic athletes. Um, they basically say, look, you can train. Um, this is, you know, especially in like archery or, or even track where there's not a lot of um, endorsements across all things. You can train and you can work at Home Depot and we'll, you know, we'll support you that way. And what intercollegiate athletics says is actually you can train for these highest levels, what big time, you know, Division I, uh, BCS, National Championship Aspiring Athletics says is come to a university, do your training here, and, you know, instead of working at Home Depot, work towards a degree that's going to have value for you in your life. And, and you can look at, for example, research on uh, baseball. Baseball is an area which for a while has, it still does have a very vibrant minor league system. If you look at it, some of the first rounders, or I don't know how many rounds, those guys actually maybe give up some earning potential if they go uh, into college rather than the pros. But once you get down in the further rounds, though people who, who are trying to live that dream through minor leagues are actually giving up a lot in terms of their, their future earning potential, in terms of their education, in, in, in getting there. And, and what intercollegiate athletics is about is saying, OK, at the highest levels, it's about saying, OK, we will support you in that dream. You have to do your, your work here, but, but you can do what most 20-year-olds in our country want to do, which is get an education that's going to set you for the rest of your life. So that's the goal. And then you have, because of that and because, um, look, we as a university can't afford to support that level of training, that level of competition um, with our budget now. I mean, we're, we're, we're strapped. And so, uh, but well before that, people said, well, let's, let's run. There's a lot of interest here, a lot of fan interest in football and basketball especially. Let's run those as a business. We'll support the educations of those athletes and, and athletic opportunities of those athletes and just the whole programs now effectively. So our athletic department pays for all of those athletic opportunities plus about $10 million in scholarships off of being able to run football and basketball primarily for revenue. Other things a little bit, although, you know, frankly, they give up revenue. They just tried recently to, to set a record. They set a school record and tried to set a Pac-12 record for women's volleyball. But, you know, they were saying basically go to the football game, go there for free, $2 tickets. That's about something else. That's about letting those women have the experience of competing in front of 6,000 cheering people. So it's not just the, the guys who get that experience. But, but primarily run a few of their things as a business, run the rest for that athletic experience. And, you know, even football and basketball are both about the, the athletic experience and the business. Um, and, 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 that's, and that's how it works. Then our mission as a committee and the university's mission, you know, interest is to say, okay, we're, we're, we're doing that, we're doing something a little bit different than we normally do. Every other business on campus is about education, not about selling tickets. So let's try to make sure that that stays aligned. And sometimes we do better and sometimes we do not as well. But that's our, but that's our job. And if we can do it well, I think it's, it's ultimately a good thing, even though it's not perfect by any means. So I think that's about where I'll stop. Great. Thanks. Um, I had the privilege of serving for several years on the IAC with Dev as well. Um, you know, my, my personal background is that uh, I have an undergraduate degree in business from this fine institution. Uh, and upon completion of my business degree uh, in a year that shall remain nameless, I uh, moved to New York City and had the best first job in the history of first jobs. Uh, and I worked at the National Football League headquarters on Park Avenue for about seven and a half years. Uh, and my job there primarily was selling corporate sponsorships and helping those corporate partners market their brands on an NFL platform. Went to graduate school, had you know the time of my life in New York City, all that was great. Um, and I have been back on campus since 2003 teaching sports business courses in the College of Business. Uh, so what I wanted to do to, to set the context for our conversation about 
the business side of sports is just to run through a few slides. This will not hurt you. It's not like class. It's not a big deal. Um, but you know, before we all have a discussion about things, um, I thought it would be important to sort of set some ground rules about um, you know sort of the key forces at work uh, in the sports industry. So here we go. Five slides. Hold on. Uh, so here we are. Um, you know about a $215 billion industry in the United States. Um, puts it in the top 10 in both size and growth in our economy. You can see there twice the size of the US auto industry and seven times the US movie industry. Um, you know, so I just put that there to give you a little bit of information in terms of, of scale. Um, but it's important that we recognize that this is business. It's business certainly at the professional level, the collegiate level too. I'd argue it's there at high school and even lower. You know, my daughter played kids sports, three-year-old taught soccer, and she came home with a Carl's Jr. logo on her t-shirt. So, you know, we are firmly in the commercialization of sport in this country. So just a couple quick business slides here, right? We are in charge of what we call P&L, profit and loss. So I just wanted to make sure that we're all clear on sort of the key drivers of both the revenue and expenses across the industry. So, you know, if you were to sort of guess the biggest expenditure um, in sort of the aggregate of the sports business, player salaries um, would probably be the first thing that comes to your mind. Um, and whether that be in the form of a paycheck at the professional level, the cost associated with tuition and aid for student athletes at the collegiate level, um, you know, the, the amount of money that's paid to participants and professional athletes um, is clearly significant. Uh, not to be underestimated is the expense on facilities. We hear a lot of things in the newspaper about the cost of building new facilities. That's one thing, uh, but I think people are very short-sighted in remembering that it costs money to keep those buildings alive and working and clean with the lights on 365 days a year. So it's more than just the capital investment in creating a new sports arena. It is ongoing costs to maintain and operate buildings in, 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 in a good, high quality operating and way. Uh, then just some other things here, you know, you and I spend money on sports equipment, we pay money to play around a golf, we buy shoes, we buy t-shirts, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then Stu spends money on marketing. <laughs> Right, but clearly the common buckets here of expenses, the most too um, relevant to our discussion uh, is the cost to pay players and athletes uh, and to maintain facilities. So that's, that's where the money goes. Where do we in the sports business make money? Again, I think most of you would come up with this own list if I, if I asked you to do so. Um, what's I, I think important and not necessarily fully understood uh, is that the real revenue driver in sport is media deals. Right, um, the dollars that are spent by media companies like CBS Television, NBC Sports, um, Comcast, Time Warner, anybody distributing content on wireless mobile devices, right? Um, anybody who is the third-party intermediary in your consumption of sport via media is spending a significant amount of do dollars for those rights. So, so the media bucket is really the lion's share these days um, in generating revenue for the sports industry. Tickets, of course, straightforward, right? You all buy tickets, again, you buy gear. Uh, corporate sponsorship, uh, which will be mentioned uh, as part of this conversation, I'm sure, is a significant driver. And again, other things that you and I spend our money on. Um, but any more in sort of the 21st century version of the US sports industry, the value of media contracts uh, is really where it's at, okay? So, so that's sort of where we're spending our money. This is where our revenue comes from. Uh, and it leads me to what I um, think are some commonly held myths and, and misconceptions uh, about making money in the sports business, right? I hear a lot of people, young and old, you know, all oh, those, you know, sports companies are just raking in the cash and they're all greedy bastards and they're just, you know, money grubbing billionaires and they got so much money, I'm sure they don't know what to do with it. Well, what they are doing is generating a lot of money. What they are not doing is making money, right? And as a business person, that's a really important distinction to make. Y'all with me there, right? Okay, just because you're generating cash doesn't mean you're actually making money because you're also spending money. 
the same time, right? So um, sports is actually, from a business perspective, year over year, when you look at business operations, a terribly unprofitable business, right? Um, the NBA announced that they are locked out and dark for the first two weeks of the season. Hold on to your pants. That number is just going to continue to expand until it's June and we still haven't seen any basketball, right? And the reason that that is happening is because 22 out of 30 NBA franchises are losing money, okay? So there is a significant amount of revenue and money generated from the sports business. Don't confuse that with sports organizations being profitable and having money at the end of the day. We'll talk more about that later. Another myth I love, if you win, that means the money will follow, right? Really hard to sort of get people to understand the backside of the business that makes that not necessarily true. Certainly winning helps, winning is good, drives interest, drives energy, drives some of those revenue buckets that, that I had up before, right? But, but I challenge you to really think about what winning could actually do tangibly to a business. And we'll get there too. Um, all, you know, the, the, the flip side of that, if you lose, you lose money, right? There are lots of sports franchises we could name right now that are not winners and you know, their businesses are still afloat. I don't know, Chicago Cubs, Golden State Warriors, take your pick. Hey. Um, <laughs> another another uh, key element that I think is really interesting in this conversation is the size of the market, right? We sort of go to this place where a team in New York is destined to be more successful than a team in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and I, again, there's just, I think, a lot of misunderstanding, you know, and that's fine, about what the forces are that drive revenue. Um, and I would submit to you that it is not a, a matter of the size of the market. It's a, it's a matter of interest in the team. And you can have plenty of interest in a team that's from a small market like the Green Bay Packers, for example. All right, so I, you know, I think th these are sort of the things I hear all the time about, well, sports business must be easy, you're making all this money, what's the problem, how, di how difficult can it be? Well, the problem is that it's very difficult, right? It is tremendously challenging to be profitable in the sports industry. The amount of money that professional sports franchises and colleges are spending on players and coaches is astronomical. You all know this, you read about things, you know about you know, billion dollar NBA contracts all the time. It is close to impossible for a sports organization to be profitable based on the costs of their player payroll, coaches payroll, and the money it costs to maintain their buildings, right? Everybody's building beautiful buildings. They cost you know, a couple hundred million dollars. So even with significant revenue generation, the vast majority of sports organizations don't make money. Um, part, of that, um, part of that sort of notion of if you win, it's good. If you lose, it's bad. If you're from a big town, it's good, um, is that there is a robust set of revenue sharing practices throughout sport. The Pac-12 conference has revenue sharing, right? So, um, you know, last spring, the then Pac-10 commissioner, Larry Scott, announced this unprecedented media deal for the Pac-10 conference, ABC, ESPN, and Fox. Maybe you all read about it, right? The monies from those deals are shared amongst all members of the conference. Same is true with all professional leagues. All those big media contracts that are now into the billions are shared with all teams across the league equally. There is so much revenue sharing happening that that actually sets the table for winning and losing maybe doesn't matter so much, right? You're gonna get the same cut of your conference television deal no matter what happens to you, right? Oregon plays in the BCS National Championship game. Every school in our conference got paid because of Oregon's participation in that bowl game and we would get paid if someone else from our conference plays in that game. So that's the kind of stuff that sort of makes for I think an interesting intellectual argument about whether or not it matters if it's Oregon that's in it or if it's Oregon State. Um, you know, there's sort of my Chicago Cubs shout out, right? There are lots of bad teams that have lots of fans who still buy season tickets, who still buy merchandise, keeps those businesses afloat. Can you be successful? Can you make money and generate revenue with a team that loses? Absolutely. Um, so that's that, I guess. Right, so um, 
I want our conversation to sort of be focused around this key difference between generating revenue, right, and being profitable and making money. Um, back to sort of the NCAA thing, Dev might have the, the exact figure these days, but it hovers around a dozen, 12 NCAA Division I athletic programs that are financially self-sustaining. Okay, 12 to 20. That is not a very big number. The rest of them, I don't know, another 120 schools plus all of D2 and D3, those athletic departments cannot generate enough revenue to sustain themselves. So they get subsidized by the General University Fund or other places, okay? So um, that's all I have. Stu, you're up. How you guys doing tonight? You guys still awake? Of course, they were just so, they were just so compelled by my little talk. All right, so uh, about a month ago, Dash, uh, who introduced us, came up to me and asked me if I would be on this panel. And I agreed to do so uh, because although I don't consider myself an expert, such as Whitney or as Dev, uh, I think that I can help you guys out by being here because like you guys, I was in your shoes three years ago when I was a freshman. Um, I feel like I've learned a lot in the last six or seven months that I've been working for uh, sports teams. Um, this summer, I worked for the AAA team for the Oakland A's. They're in Sacramento. They're called the River Cats. And uh, currently, I'm a marketing intern for the uni for this uh, university that you're attending right now. Um, I want to tell you guys that if you guys are interested in pursuing a career in sports, you're at the University of Oregon at an amazing time because our school's recognition, national recognition, and its athletic brand has never been stronger. Between the efforts of the Warsaw Sports Marketing Department, uh, the creation of the uh, Matt Knight Arena over there by Bean, and uh, just uh, our strong performance out on the football field have definitely added a lot of ooh and ah factors to uh, what we provide here at the school. Um, what I want to uh, get across, though, and that I think I can help most with, is that I know a lot of people who want to work in sports, and I know very few that have actually been able to do so. Uh, when I was a freshman, I lived right over there in Deku, and every guy on my floor wanted to be a sports marketing major and work for the Ducks, or work for Nike, or work for the Trailblazers. And of the 10 or so guys that wanted that, I'm the only one that's still in the sports marketing department. Um, and the biggest reason is desire. Most people fail to recognize how much effort it takes to get to where you want to be. Um, I think a good example is that this summer, I was told that I was going to get to do marketing for the Sacramento River Cats, and I ended up being more or less a male cheerleader. For those of you who know me and are friends with me on Facebook, uh, you can see uh, firsthand evidence of this. I, my profile photo is me dressed as a giant Coca-Cola can dancing on a dugout <laughs> during the sixth inning because we were helping Coca-Cola with its sponsorship. I have also done glorious uh, works in my time. I was the Kraft Singles. You guys know what Kraft is, right? The cheese company. You guys have had it? Not that good. It comes in little sheets that so you got to unwrap in plastic. OK. I had to get up on the roof once a game and toss out Kraft Singles to people from the roof while uh, some rock song from the 80s played in the background because I was the Kraft Singles roof man. And while, and while I really don't feel like, it's obviously not what I signed up to do. <laughs> um, it did end up proving necessary because I was able to make the contacts necessary with the people in the organization they were able to put in a good word for me here 
to help me land my internship here at the University of Oregon. Um, and that actually segues into my next main point, which is um, this is a industry where a lot of uh, being able to move up to where you want to be is based on who you know. And that doesn't mean that if your dad knows somebody who works for Nike that you're necessarily guaranteed an internship at Nike. That's actually not the case at all. Um, I see an Angels fan in the front row. All right, this is a shout out to your team. <laughs> My mom is, uh, well, she dated uh, the head of ticket sales for the Anaheim Angels. She went ahead and called him up and asked if he could get me a position, and he laughed. And the reason being is because I was one of several hundred people that called him because they knew him in some capacity and they wanted a position. And that's in addition to the 500 some odd applicants that they got just you know from people that saw the ad and applied. And that's only for six spots. So when people say it's who you know, it is the people that you have taken the time to develop the relationships with, the working relationships that they can call upon uh, when uh, conducting an interview, they can call someone up and say, hey, is, uh, is Cooper a good candidate for this position? And they can say, no, Cooper smells funny. Or they can say, oh, he's awesome. Let's use him. He'd be a no-brainer to hire. That's what you're looking for. And uh, that's what you want to create with anywhere you go. Um, also, finally, uh, when I was in the office today at Autzen, I asked my, uh, the head of my department what he thought the best piece of advice would be to give you guys. And he said that all too often, uh, people in your position and my position, we shoot for the top of the ladder as quick as we possibly can, and we don't realize that sometimes you have to start small. You might have to start out being the Kraft Singles roof man in Sacramento for the Sacramento River Cats. He is current, his name is Craig, Craig Pintons. He is the Senior Associate Athletic Director for Public Relations, which is a big fancy way of saying he's the head of marketing for the Ducks. And his first job, he was a stadium usher at the University of Wisconsin. Now, that is obviously a big jump from stadium usher the head of the department of arguably the most exciting athletic department in college football. So um, in case you guys don't know, I also work at the Hamilton area desk. I deliver the mail. So I'm here mostly to sit and field your questions. Anything you have, I have lots of advice I can give about where to look how to look, how to present yourself when trying to get internships. You need to jump on that as quick as possible. If money is not that big of an issue to you, I would highly suggest you try to get an internship for the summer because the more experience you have, the better when you try to get a job for real like I'm about to do when I graduate this spring. Um, almost every single job position I've seen for an entry level job has said needs at least two years of relevant experience. And I don't have that, and that scares me. So I'd like to help you guys be in the best position possible. So whether it's here tonight or over at the Hamilton area desk while I'm getting your mail, feel free to come by and uh, ask me a couple questions, pick my brain. I can point you guys in the right direction. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Can we have another round of applause for these guys? <laughs> All right. We're going to go into the Q&A section now. And I'm going to start with a few questions of my own. Who got uh, tickets to the game this Saturday? Y'all are lucky. Yeah. <laughs> Luck of the draw. Uh, so that's a pretty fun event right there. Anybody been there before? Gone to a game? Good deal. Good deal. It's a lot of fun. 
how, I have a question for my panelists now. How much would you estimate, roughly, a single game costs? What do you mean? Just to put it on. Oh, the operational cost of one game. Um, oh, we're at least in the, I think we're at least in the tens of millions. No, not for a single, for a single game, I would guess in about three or four million. Really? For a game. Oh, yeah. my bad. Football, <laughs> the football budget's around 20, 25 million, if I remember correctly. Oh, okay. Um, and that's probably a little bit high because the football team tends to pay for a lot of things that all the teams use. Right. That's just how they kind of go. So they might sort of, in the football budget, might be the weight room that every single team uses. And that's just kind of the way they do things. But I'm not sure why. So. I would guess three to four million to operate Odson one Saturday. Nice. I'm much happier to have a free ticket now. <laughs> it's so. not free. It's not free. Right? Why is it not free? Not tuition. Why is it not free? Why is your ticket not free? You Who is paying for the seat? Student government, right? That incidental fee that rolls on your bill that either you pass on to your parents or someone else, right? Incidental fees. ASUO has, has negotiated a contract with athletics. So the money that you pay into the general ASUO fund is what pays for your tickets. But it's probably at less than, the athletic department by making that deal with the ASUO is seeing less money than they could make right. if they made it available to the general public, right. got a seat donation associated right. with it, yada, yada. So yeah. it's, it's the, students are, the student that you're paying, but you're not paying as much as you would sort of face value in some sense. Right. It's probably at the most, you're probably paying at the most 50% of the value of that seat. So, sorry, just have to clarify they're not free. Yeah, in the back. For Oregon, not much. Yeah, not much additional cost, but not a whole lot of additional revenue either. Because as she said, revenue sharing, you do at the end of the season, they take every team, they look how many games were covered, uh, you know, regionally, nationally, et cetera. You get a little bit more, but again, they don't, uh, and this makes sense. You don't want the incentives to be, oh my gosh, if we don't win right now, we're tanking. It's something like our payout from the, tw the, the Pac-12 is two million versus two and a half, two and three quarters, which is, which is significant, but not like make or break in an athletic department's budget. So they'll see a little bit more of that because they get that one additional national exposure, but they're not raking it in from that by any means. Right, and to, to put that in context, um, again, Deb will have the exact number, but you know, the Oregon Athletic Department budget this year is hovering around $90 million. Yeah. So, you know, an extra 250 yeah. grand for a Saturday night game on ESPN is uh, not significant. Yeah. It's nice, not significant. 87 million, but about 12 million is for debt service, so it depends on how you wanna, in other words, they're, they're paying the mortgage on Night Arena each and every year, $12 million. And so, any other questions? How come he has a nice blue jean? Come on, people. <laughs> Ooh. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. So, there's been discussions about a Pac 12, Pac 16, Pac 14. Um, profits from TV deals and how that could ease um, the college payments for each game, the team. Well, what I'm wondering is why would someone make the choice to not forgo that and stay as a Pac-12, to not expand? What would be the benefits that you could gain by not expanding? First, what are really the benefits of expanding? You get additional media markets. So essentially, we say we added Utah and Colorado, but from someone in the Pac-12's office, we added Denver and Salt Lake and much of the rest of the, et cetera. So, um, uh, but, you know, 
let me ask, let me change your question. Um, why not add Boise State? They're, they've got a good football team, and football's driving most of this, by the way. Um, here's another bit of trivia. The conferences are a separate entity than the NCAA. Right. The, and the conferences got together to do the BCS. And if you, if you pay close attention, the NCAA is not too happy that the conferences get all this media money. And essentially, you know, the NCAA is ultimately in charge of you know, enforcing rules. And they're not necessarily seeing. They're getting a lot of money from the NCAA tournament and basketball. That's the NCAA's ma main thing of revenue. But look, people talk about the NCAA needing more resources for enforcement. But all that revenue that's going through the conferences is not going to the NCAA. So there's, you, you look at this and you realize, and, and, and it's not like people say in public from the NCAA, damn, I hate those conferences. But there's a little tension there. Um, so, so why do it is if you feel like by adding those additional markets, those additional schools, you can bring in more revenue than, you know, per school than otherwise. Why not? And here's one of the main things. Um, the, the conferences realize that, that we're choosing our cohort. And, and even back in the 80s, there was, um, I'm, a, I'm in the math department, by the way, and I'm an algebraic topologist. Um, not that many of you would know what that is. Um, but there was a university president who was an algebraic topologist. Paul Olam was his name. It was the Olam Center that both of our kids go to. Um, his wife uh, is, is a namesake there. And back in the 80s when, when our football team was not so hot <laughs> and, and nobody would have cried too much if we decided to switch to, say, the Mountain West or something, um, he decided to stick in the Pac-10. And, 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 and remember that at that point there, the university is paying because you know the football team wasn't generating a lot of, of monies to stay in basically because uh, look then we're in the same conference in some sense in the sense that matter that's most salient for most people same conference as Stanford Cal UCLA etc um, and so that in a nutshell is why not Boise State right. basically there are believe it or not there People, when they do these things, they look at the academic profiles, the overall profiles, and they want to be defined uh, in part by the, the, the other schools in their conference. They want to feel comfortable with that. Um, so, so that's basically, those are probably the two biggest why, why not. Why? More money. Why not? Uh, because you might not feel like your school and that school really belong together in a cohort. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add is the, is the, the competitive question, right? The, the money piece flows from the competitiveness of the members of the conference. So, you know, to just have a question of to expand or not um, needs to take into account who those particular new schools might be. And they need to be strong schools in addition to strong media markets. Um, you know, for the revenue generation piece, but also I would I would challenge you all to sort of consider, you know, what it would feel like on an ongoing basis to be in a conference with a school like Texas. I know you all think it's very exciting, um, but you know there are some real sort of com some competitive ramifications to think about, right? People are interested in a school because they're successful, they win, they are at the top of their conference all the time, and so you know. The revenue, the revenue generation piece, which is the, the key driver for the conference, would need to be balanced by the schools individually and how they think that's going to impact their competitiveness within their own conference. Um, you know, and that's not nothing in terms of consideration. Jeff Garrett has a question. I believe that Oregon is one of the few athletic departments that operates in the surplus or close to it. Yeah. And with the new Pac-12 TV contracts that will probably clearly put them over the surplus, would they expect to share that money back with the school who's been supporting the athletic department for decades? So they, um, those monies were pretty much spoken for with the last round of, um, of, of sort of program expansion, adding baseball and stunts and gymnastics. So right now, they're meeting their own bills, and that includes the mortgage on the Matthew Knight Arena. 
but only by drawing down on the legacy fund, that $100 million night of gift of night and, and others. So yes, they are paying their own bills, but only by drawing heavily on their bank account. They are, I can't even remember how many years away before they're gonna be able to cover their mortgage with their own revenues. Right, whatever um, it is, it's more than they're saying. Huh? It's more than they're it's, saying. Yeah, <laughs> they might say 10 years, 12 years out, and it's probably 15 or 20. Yeah. So that's, um, I mean, basically, Matt Court needed to be replaced. Phil Knight gave us $100 million with a big string attached that he wanted a really nice arena. Um, we're probably in a better position. We're, we're certainly in a better position than if we replaced Matt Court on our own. Um, we would be, the university would undoubtedly spend a lot of money there. But on the other hand, because of that fairly ambitious plan, their revenues are pretty well tied up for a while. So the, the way I, I look at it is, um, you know, without Knight and his gifts, we're looking at sort of Oregon State. We're looking at $5 million to $10 million, us subsidizing them. So it would be nice if they could give money to us, but we're really lucky that, that we're basically neutral, whatever that is. And, and again, the gifts, the way those gifts were structured kind of sets that in, in, not in stone, but, but sets that pretty well. Yeah, a couple of things I sort of want to add to that conversation is that, um, you know, any athletic department would tell you that they, you know, are about their own enterprise. And so they use language like reinvesting surplus funds back into the enterprise. So if you ask them what they would do with any extra dollars, they would funnel it back to programs that support student athletes. So whether that's more, you know, workout and training facilities or better academic support or better equipment, you know, the a general, you know, university athletic department would always desire to take the excess funds and put it back into athletics. The other thing that I think is interesting um, about sort of giving money back to the university, when the, the UO athletic department puts their budget together, um, because of our public status, they you know, need to make most of those documents available to the public. Um, they create a list of dollars um, and put a big number on it and say, this is how much money we give back to the university all the time, starting with the $10 million in scholarships to student athletes. Um, they will put down on paper the 50% of the cost for football tickets that the ASUO is not paying, and they'll call that money to the university. They give President LaRiviere a suite at Autzen Stadium. They put a dollar figure on that and say we're giving that money to the university. You know what I mean? So they, they want to tell, um, and they do tell, a story about a robust support to the university side of the campus. And so they will always calculate and articulate a value that they believe constitutes sort of an ongoing support of the university. Another random tidbit, since we're in the business of random tidbits. Um, the University Athletic Department covers the operational expenses for the Oregon Marching Band, right? They play at football games, they play at basketball games. Um, and so the, ath the Athletic Department would say, this is another way that we demonstrate that we're supporting the university because we pay for the band. So let me, let me follow up a little bit on that because it is, there are programs that write checks, mostly in the SEC, which, you know, some of you guys might have heard of the SEC. <laughs> um, uh, so they'll write checks over just, you know, President Scholarship Fund. That includes Kentucky, Kentucky, where Rob Mullins, our current athletic director, was before, Florida. Um, you know, the, a big difference, most of those places that do that have a football stadium that seats 80,000 people, okay? Um, we don't, and if, uh, and I haven't done any of these numbers because I'm not actually a sports marketing person. I'm just sort of paying attention from the academic side. But if you, for, if you ran a regression, so I'm a mathematician, of, uh, of football stadium size versus sort of uh, how you are on your operating budget surplus versus how much of a deficit, U of O's gotta be way off that regression line. And basically, sort of, the, the way I look at it is our football team and then our programs are competing be, at a high level among all these places, uh, funded not by an 80,000 seat football stadium, but by a 60,000 seat football stadium 
plus Phil Knight and the donor community. Okay, and that's, but that, that does make a difference. You know, your 80,000 seat football stadium doesn't earmark where that money is going to go. Right. Whereas Phil Knight and the rest of the do donor community does have some ideas about making donations to this part of the university or that part of the university and generally wanting it to stay there. So just as the university won't take a big gift in the sciences and say, wait, you know, our, our fine arts programs are really underserved, so sorry, Mr. Loki, we're gonna take a couple million off of that. You, you don't do that. That just kills your, <laughs> your, 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 your relations with your whole donor community if you do that. It's, it's gonna be similar here. But as it is, the fact that we're not academically subsidizing like pretty much every other Pac-12 school puts us in a pretty good position. Could we be better? Sure, if they gave us money. But we're pretty good at where we are. What's interesting, too, about Oregon Athletics, you know, I started teaching here in 2003, and the athletic department budget that year was $45 million, right? So in... <laughs> eight short years, we've gone from 45 to 87. What's important, I think, to note about that is that where the athletic department nets out in terms of what they have in the bank at the end of every year is exactly the same as it was in 2003. You know what I mean? Are you with me there? So the budget was you know, virtually half then what it is today, but the relative health, financially speaking, of the department is exactly the same as it was. Which, you know, back to Jeff's key point, is that when you generate more revenue, you're spending more money, right? So they're, they're taking in a significant more um, than they were in 2003, but that's going out the door to Chip Kelly and his friends and not his friends, you know, other coaches and things like that. But um, the relative financial position is exactly the same as it was when the athletic department's budget was half the size. Yeah. And, and again, to, to, to just make that concrete, they're also earning maybe about a million dollars a year on concerts, et cetera, Matthew Knight great, Arena. Great point. You know, those are coming out through, you know, th they work with promoters, et cetera, so they're not actually calling up, you know, Sting and saying, hey, you want to <laughs> come to, to Eugene? But anyways, um, but to make that million dollars, they've had to add staff, and they have to pe pay people to, you know, sell popcorn and sweep up, and et cetera. And it's hard to say. So you, you look at that extra million dollars and say, Oh, okay. They're they're earning another million there, but you know, first of all, that that extra was earmarked for them to be able to pay the the rent, the mortgage on the on the arena, and second, they had to pay money to earn that money. What do you think, Stu? You haven't said anything recently. I think that's really tough because obviously that uh, that goes directly against the NCAA's mission statement of providing the highest in amateur athletics while making sure that our stu the student athletes receive high levels of education. Uh, but at the same time, um, did anybody see that ESPN 30 for 30 documentary about the Fab Five with Chris Weber, Jalen Rose, Juwan Howard? One of the one of the compelling arguments that they bring up in that documentary is Chris Weber walking through the University of Michigan bookstore and seeing his number four Michigan jersey on the wall for sale for seventy dollars, and he gets absolutely none of it. The other the other side to that is, um, you know, athletes having to get to practice but they don't have a car. Every day I walk in, I drive into the athletic department, and I see uh, Lavoisier Tuine getting dropped off by a different person every single day, and he's the star wide receiver on the team, number 80, if you don't know who that is. Um, I don't really know, per se, how I would have to side. Um, I think that... I think that I don't think they should be paid necessarily just because I think they should be here to try to get an education. And if some of them are good enough in their respective sports to go on to the pros and make their millions, that's awesome. 
but for the vast majority of them, this is it. And, you know, God forbid if they get hurt out on the playing field, you know, the end to their playing days is a lot sooner. And they need to, I feel like they need to have something that makes them feel like they're not rock stars all the time. Because at some point they won't be rock stars. They will be, you know, everyday Americans with a mortgage and kids and everything like that. And they need to learn how to support themselves personally. And that's, that's where I personally stand. Casey, you really want to know what I think? They get paid. <laughs> they get paid. It, it, it comes in a tangible format that is not cash. <laughs> um, but that's the world, right? We, we often, as professionals, or even amateurs, I guess, in this case, right, we get remunerated and compensated in non-cash ways all the time. Um, and so I think they get paid. You know, they... Um, they are extracting something with a dollar value on it. Um, and so I think they get paid already. So, um, yeah, along those lines, people estimate it at anywhere from, say, fifty dollars to $80,000 a year, um, the value of, of, of what they get in terms of their scholarship, the extra support, the training opportunities. Um, but it is an important thing to remember that even in the revenue sports, most, most, most will not, will not make uh, a single dime on their professional athletic careers. So it's, it's, it's a bit redistributive, but, but I'm okay with that. So, um, you know, you have, the Ducks have, what they had one guy who was drafted last year in the actual NFL draft. Mm -hmm. They had a few other guys who got picked up. So maybe a half a dozen guys in a year. Maybe it'll become more as they become higher profile. That's out of a team of 120, you know, graduating 30. Um, so it's, it's, it's the 30th guy. It, it's, you know, the top six, you could say, okay, maybe they should be getting paid. They're not getting paid. And all those other guys are also getting that fifty to $80,000 value a year. So to those who talk about how unfair the system is, and there's, there's even um, you know comparisons with slavery, that perfectly respectfully respectful intellectual people are making, like out in the athletic Atlantic Monthly, um, which I kind of wonder you know if Michael James thought he was signing on for another year of slavery when he decided not to go to the NFL last year, Andrew Luck, or even our own Matt Centrowitz, who was third in the World Champs in in the the fifteen hundred. He clearly could have a professional life, and he's decided to stick around for another year. I w so the, 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 you know, I think the slavery talk needs to, to end. There is talk about maybe getting some cost of living uh, stipends, and I could see that happening. Um, there's some already, by the way, for the guys who really can't afford the basics. The NCA has uh, some, some support already, but I could see that being beefed up. But at the end of the day, with the way it is, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Cam Newtons, et cetera, they could clearly be pulling in six figures while competing at this level, but not many can. And at their expense, I would happily then serve that, you know, the 80 scholarship guys who are getting an education. You know, you, you have to think about if, what, what are we comparing to? Let's look at, like, say, the European club soccer system. Those guys are getting paid. There's seven-year-olds getting contracts now. Um, but I still think, and nobody, I don't think anybody, this, here's a project for somebody who wants to do a serious re research project. Try to figure out a similarly athletically talented 16-year-old in football here and in football <laughs> over there and sort of look at their lives. And, if, and I think, you know, maybe the, the, the soccer player, the football player, will, will do better if he has a professional career, especially because, you know, NFL salaries are so regulated. But if you're just really talented, if you're enough to get a Division I scholarship but maybe not make the NFL, I'd say stick here. Get an education because uh, the chances of making the NFL, the chances of making the Premier League are so small. Go for the system which is actually paying you through an education and training and a unique experience um, rather than the one that will say, okay, here's $20,000 for your family, which sounds great, and then after a few years you have no marketable skills. 
Yeah. And, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Um, just go back on what he said about uh, helping athletes out with the cost of living. Uh, the number one problem I mm -hmm. see with that is that even if uh, <clears throat> even if each university gave every football player they had maybe five hundred dollars a month to live, which you know is a pretty good amount. Uh, I feel like that would uh, be severely detrimental to the competition, uh, the level of competition. Uh, with all, we just spent a good deal of time talking about how uh, most universities barely break even, and a lot of them owe a lot of money, like UC Berkeley, for example, almost having to cut their baseball team and even their football team to some degree. Um, big schools that put a lot of money into football, like a Florida, like an LSU, even, you know, the Ducks, uh, those types of schools could afford to pay the athletes, but the smaller schools with the smaller budgets, even really successful ones like a Boise State, I feel like would bankrupt themselves just trying to remain competitive because if I'm a top level recruit and LSU is gonna give me $500 a month for food and clothes and whatever, but Boise State isn't because they can't afford it, where am I gonna go, you know? It'll, it'll, by the way, there was, you know, people say, oh, there's all these teams that are good all of a sudden, and U of O is like number one on that list. But it, it's really, it used to be, you know, you if you weren't Notre Dame or Michigan or Ohio State or Texas, you know, forget about it. And people still complain. But one of the main things that happened, it used to be uh, before the conferences and the NCAA would, was controlling TV, there would be basically one game a week. And so whoever you are, you were a kid, you wanted exposure. Even if, you know, USC had five great tailbacks, Texas had five great tailbacks. If I wanted to be on TV and get that exposure to go to the NFL, I'd go one of those places. And one thing that's happened now that, you know, doesn't get a lot of notice is because of that sort of media saturation, which don't get me wrong, has its downside. I, I, you know, I personally think we watch way too much TV and, and especially way too much sports. But anyways, um, because you have that media saturation, um, you know, you can get your exposure playing for Missouri now, playing for Boise State. And that's leveled the playing field. And, you know, I'm kind of I'm kind of neutral on that, frankly, from the point of view of the university serving its student athletes, et cetera. But from a fan and from a sort of fairness to other places, I could see how that's a counterbalance to the, you know, let's let's make sure that some student athletes who are suffering financially um, have it have it better. So there's there's a balance there. You know, something Dev said reminded me of a point that I w hoped would come up, and so I'm going to make it happen now. Um, you know, uh, uh, there is a lot of there are a lot of people who have a lot of negative things to say about the state of collegiate athletics, um, and that it is too commercial and that it is too much about a business and that it is not central to admission of a university. Um, but what I think is important to point out is that when university presidents collectively have gone to athletics and said, we're not going to support you financially, right? The goal from my perspective as a university president is that the athletic department is financially self-sufficient. That gives birth to the need for commercialization, you know what I mean? They just said to you, "I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to help support your operations. You've got to figure out a way to generate enough revenue for yourself." Well, okay, you just turned me into a business by cutting off the checkbook, right? And so, in large measure, um, the de you know, what, however you feel about the degree of commercialization, however you feel about the degree of media contracts and how much they're worth and what is out there in saturation or not, right? Athletic departments and athletic directors are responding to a directive which says, support yourself. And so this is the result, right? So I would say to those people who you know, think that the pristine nature of amateur collegiate athletics is not what they want it to be, I would say then get ready to subsidize athletics like you subsidize the English department. And if you're not ready to do that, um, bring on College Game Day on ESPN, 
presented by Home Depot, also available on Comcast, Sportsnet, and ESPN3 on your Verizon mobile device. I mean, that said, I think, and this is one of our jobs, is to sort of set, try to set some boundaries at, at some point. You know, you're not going to, not that they would ever suggest it, but, you know, you're not going to have some sort of talent, beefcake or cheesecake calendars that they could probably produce and sell and make money. And, but, and, and this is where even I think that, that, yeah, maybe let's talk about the jerseys. Like if, it, 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 yeah, the, maybe uh, we're not letting the student athletes make money off of those. Maybe we shouldn't make money off of those, you know? It's, it's money, but, but let's have that conversation or especially somehow to me the <coughs> video game thing. The, the fact that sort of in video games, that seems more, you know, marketing the ducks. And by the way, if you, here's a detail that you might have noticed. They tend not to, they, they did about six, eight years ago, have more individual billboards. Like you could act, you would actually see LaMichael's face or Darren's face or whoever. They, they've gotten away from that in part for, for a decision that said, okay, let's be about the team. Let's not put the student athletes in a position that they're being marketed and that puts them in, a, in, in, a, in this weird place. I mean, they're still getting so much media coverage, but that's not a lot from the athletic department. That's the register guard, the Oregonian, going up to them with microphones and saying, hey, you know, tell us about this. Um, so, but, but yeah, I, I would talk about boundaries. And, and for me personally, like the whole video game, the, the individual, you know, the fact that, that LaMichael's probably, and I don't know, is he faster like on these EA sports games that, that, that you do? <laughs> um, so when you really get down to that sort of marketing of the individual, I would say, all right, maybe let's give up that revenue. Let's sort of remember who we are and say we don't need to make every dollar that we can necessarily. Even though it goes to some place good, let's sort of, let's be about the team, et cetera. And by the way, the, the media thing brings me um, to, to a moment that, a story that probably not a lot of you know, but it's, it definitely was one of the, the things that, that really I appreciated as a member of our committee. Um, and this is in the U.S. Congressional record of the Senate. Senator Wyden passed along a story that President LaRiviere told him. This was a story of the locker room uh, after the BCS championship. And it was Chip saying to the team, said, in, in 10 minutes, you're going to have all these guys sticking microphones up to your face and saying, how does it feel to come short in the biggest moment of your life? And Chip says, just remember, this wasn't the biggest moment of your life. The biggest moments of your life will be graduation, getting married, when your kids are born, you know, all those things. You start a business and it succeeds. Um, this isn't it. Remember that. And, and, and that's just awesome. That is absolutely what you want your, your, your coach to be saying because it's absolutely true. Um, and, and that's another thing we pay attention to and that can be lost in sort of the, the end of the day, how did they do this week, is what are the values of the program? Are the coaches imparting the values we want? Are they, um, are they emphasizing academics? You know, half the football team had a 3-0 or better last fall. Um, also probably not something that made headlines, but our committee was extremely happy to hear. So, you know, you, what do you pay attention to? What are your values? And let's on occasion, sure, maybe forego some income because of our values. On the other hand, because a lot of this money is going to programs that not only are about rah-rah, but are about scholarships and, you know, unique character building and personal building opportunities, let's say, okay, you know, we, we will do that. Um, I want to teach you something else. So you brought up the jersey thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding, too, about the licensed merchandise business. It's very complicated. I'm not going to explain it all to you. Um, but I just want you to go back to that visual of a jersey, right? A number 21 jersey hanging in the duck store, right? There are three entities that are making money on the sale of that jersey. What are they? Go. Right, the manufacturer of the jersey, the duck store, the retailer, and Oregon Athletics. Okay, so in any sort of in any sort of licensed merchandise scenario, whether it's a Phillies cap or something else, right? You have the trademark rights holder, Oregon Athletics, the University of Oregon to be exact, 
the retail partner, the duck store, and the manufacturer of the jersey, right? In the scenario of the jersey on the shelf, Oregon Athletics is making the least on the sale of that jersey. Manufacturers make more, the retailers make more, right? Uh, sports licensing um, is a business model that operates on a, a per unit royalty on the wholesale transaction of that jersey. So that means that Nike is paying the University of Oregon for the right of, for that jersey on the wholesale transaction, not on the retail transaction. So it means Oregon is getting paid on the $15 that Nike sold it to the duck store for rather than the $65 that the duck store sold it to you for. Y'all with me? Okay. So Oregon Athletics gets paid on the wholesale transaction, so that's you know a good third less than the retail point. And the going rate you know, in collegiate athletics for a per unit royalty rate is still less than 10%, right? So on a good day, let's call it eight and a half or 9%. So the, or so the University of Oregon would make eight and a half percent off of a $15 sale. And that's for a jersey, right? So if you sort of trickle down to the less valuable items, eye black, lip gloss, you know, anything that costs you at the duck store $5 to buy, Oregon Athletics is making a dime, okay? So the margin in sports licensing is not on the side of the trademark rights holder. The people making the real money on licensed merchandise sales are manufacturers and retailers, okay? So that doesn't answer the question of whether or not LaMichael should get a piece of that. I just want to clarify that it's not the University of Oregon who's making a ton of money on jersey sales. It's the other members of that value stream. Yeah. Do you see any potential danger with ESPN <laughs> like self-financing certain teams to go independent like BYU and uh, their offer to Texas to go independent on conference alignment in the next 20 to even 50 years? Well, I know uh, I'm not a big, I don't, I'm not a big expert on this one, but I do know that one of the main reasons a lot of the Big 12 schools want out of the Big 12 right now is because of the Texas network that they have that is uh, in large part, uh, you're gonna have to help me out. Is it funded by ESPN or funded? Okay, it is funded by ESPN. And obviously that is a huge revenue stream that Texas can have for themselves that they, can't, that they don't have to share with an Oklahoma or a Oklahoma State or mo probably most notably a Texas A&M who just left for the SEC. Um, but also what I think is dangerous is they were originally talking about um, broadcasting high school football games in the state of Texas on uh, the Texas network. And, um, you know, for people that are familiar with prep football, it's widely believed that the top recruits in the country come from Southern California, Texas, Florida, sometimes Georgia, but mostly those three states. Uh, testament to this idea, we uh, both our starting quarterback and our starting running back here at the University of Oregon are from the state of Texas. Darren Thomas is from Houston. Uh, LaMichael's from Texarkana, which is almost Arkansas, but still Texas. And uh, the fear there is that if they can show at, they can show the the games uh on this network then that would obviously lead uh recruits to want to go to texas over anywhere else you know jeff the concern that i have with it isn't really one about sport it's a bigger question about the role of media in this country what what we're talking about there is the media distributor owning the content Right, and that I think is what the, the bigger question is. Uh, to me, it, it, it's not a question of individual schools and revenue sharing and all of that. It's a bigger question, I think, um, about whether or not the, the media outlet uh, should own in a proprietary fashion the content, right? So look at things like um, 
NBC's Universal and this purchase by Comcast cable, right? So now Comcast has not only a monopoly on cable in certain markets, but they actually now own all of the NBC Universal content. And so, you know, it just flies in the face of the way that we've traditionally looked at the role of media in this country. So to me, it's about, you know, media outlets owning in a proprietary manner a certain content. And I'll pass, because I really think beyond the Pac-12, to be honest. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Um, I want to go back to the Russian question. Um, yep. And so Sky Cam was in negotiated price. Uh, I'm not surprised that they came up with three. Um, what, what do you think the answer is? Why not? I mean, it's a sad answer, really, for us Duck fans. What's the, re what's the true answer to Casey's question? Why can't the University of Oregon negotiate for a higher royalty rate on merchandise? Mm. No. Yes, sir. Oh, there's nothing about fair in this business. <laughs> the answer is, unfortunately, our brand is just not that powerful from a licensing perspective, okay? Um, There are, st you know, th the vision for this institution and this brand, this O brand, right, is that it's nationally compelling, nationally recognized, and has a national retail footprint, okay? You all with me here when I say that? It, ju it just unfortunately doesn't yet, okay? So there's sort of this sort of um, story that you want to develop, right, where some kid in Topeka, Kansas, walks into the Lids store at his local mall because he wants to go get him an Oregon Ducks cap, right? Somebody who has never been to the state of Oregon, probably can't pronounce it, has no intention of coming <laughs> to the <laughs> University of Oregon and doesn't know anybody who went to the University of Oregon, but the brand is so relevant that he wants to rock the hat, right? You know what I mean? Like people do across this country for Texas and Florida and North Carolina and whatever else. You know what I'm saying? So, so the reason that Oregon is not getting a bigger piece of the merchandise pie is because there's still 95% of people buying Oregon merchandise live in the Willamette Valley. And so we have to get a national retail presence where kids from all across the country are buying an Oregon hat instead of a Texas hat or instead of a whatever cap. Um, and they're just not doing it. You know, as much as we love the ducks, it's still, like I said, in the high 90s in terms of the percentage of where all the retail sales are coming from are right here. And so until that brand becomes a, natu a nationally powerful retail brand, the, the royalty rates will stay low. What is, um, like, ticket sales? How how much money is brought in from just ticket sales? Oh, I don't know. What what do you think the average face value of a ticket at Austin Stadium is? Sort of take the low and the high and find some median number. My parents uh, came to the Nevada game to start the season, and uh, the face value of their tickets in the 60th row. Uh, was about sixty dollars. Food for thought. Right. So, so <laughs> I don't know. We, what do you want to call it? Sixty or seventy, right? Times sixty thousand. Okay. Um, you know, plus some change in the luxury suites. But, but what what I like about that question is what one of my sort of, you know, points of myth busting is. Um, you know, Dev said we've got a small building. You know, I can't put any more people in it, right? So last year, you, you, you have a team that wins their conference. You have a team that participates in the national championship game. I was already sold out. I was already selling 5,000 standing room only tickets. I don't have any more inventory. So, so what's the actual tangible upside if my team is winning? All I can do is ratchet up ticket prices. I don't have anything more to sell, right? And so... If you're selling out your building, you're selling them out on a bad game, you're selling them out on a big game, and so there's not a big delta for you. 
But then to complete the question, just did a little arithmetic. Um, so that, that would be 4.2 million oh. off the face value of the tickets. But then there's these seat donations. So the students in the student section don't have to deal with this. But uh, for the general public, you want those good seats, you make a donation to the Duck Athletic Fund. Uh, that is 80% tax deductible, by the way. Um, and, uh, and those, I would have estimated, bring in another like 20 million for football, divide that by seven games, that's about three million, brings you to a little over seven million. And that was what my guess was gonna be. So how about very that? Very good, very good. So here's a question for all you guys. So, uh, you know, there's this game on the schedule or maybe it's a game, a home game later on in the season, right? Um, that is all of a sudden a really big game, right? It it's, it's makes the Ducks win the North Division or something, right? When the open market begins to put a value on a sport event ticket that is higher than the face value of that ticket, who sees that extra value? <laughs> yes. Um, so if let's let's okay. Yours. Let's let's agree that the face value of an average Austin Stadium ticket is sixty dollars. USC is going to come to town in a month, and let's pretend that the scenarios surrounding that game have made that a really super awesome, exciting game, and the marketplace has decided that a ticket to that game is hundred and fifty dollars, not the face printed sixty dollars. Okay, so that's now a sort of market margin of ninety dollars. Where does that ninety dollars go? Okay, right. The secondary ticket market, StubHub's, Craigslist, everybody else. Everybody other than Oregon Athletics, right? So go back to your sort of question again about upside and ticketing, right? They make the decision before the season starts that the price of a ticket in December is going to be X dollars. So if the market drives up the, the value of that ticket, Oregon Athletics is not getting that margin. Some secondary ticket market person service website is. And that is actually a really quickly emerging area of the sports business. Sports teams across collegiate and professional ranks are really tired, are really tired of StubHub and you all ticket prospectors out there making money when the value of a ticket appreciates in the open market. So they're dying for systems, digital-based internet ticketing systems that will allow them to take advantage of something like this. So when all of a sudden a game is bigger than you imagined it was gonna be, you as the sports organization can take advantage of that increase in value. But right now, Oregon Athletics isn't set up to do that. So when people in the secondary market are selling, mon selling tickets and making money higher than the face value, Oregon still just gets their $60. And uh, that's why you see a lot of professional teams um, trying to label games as marquee games as early on in the season as they can. A uh, good example, when I was studying in New Orleans for a term, I went to go see the Hornets play uh, the Nuggets back when they had Carmelo. I sat in the nosebleed, my ticket was $11. And I came back two weeks later to see them play the Miami Heat with LeBron and D Wade and Bosch and my same seat roughly was $45. So, uh, and as far as I know, tickets on StubHub were up in the eighties. So I made, I saved money by buying it through the team. Uh, but also the other teams have tried more exotic things to try to recapture some of the value. Um, I know that the San Francisco giants, uh, have a deal with StubHub where they try to recoup some of the value by uh, selling the tickets through them uh, on the website, trying to get the people who bought the season tickets to sell them back uh, through them. Uh, but the jury's still kind of out as far as we know on how well those work. I think my question is, do you see, um, do you see 
media organizations like Root Sports um, becoming more profitable and covering more sports events at the high school level? Well, um, separate from how I feel about it, the, the business piece of, of those media outlets, again, goes back to paying some fee, right? So if Root Sports or whatever it is is broadcasting some content, they paid for the right to do that. So let's just, for argument's sake, say it's you know the Oregon 6A state football championship. Um, you know, so they ostensibly have paid the OSAA a rights fee for the right to be able to broadcast the content, okay? So it's only gonna make sense for Root if they can generate enough revenue to compensate for what they had to pay to broadcast the content. You with me, right? So the question for me, you know, as a business person then becomes, what's the demand, right? Are you willing to spend more money in your monthly cable bill because you need to pay for more sports content on Root Sports, right? That's why, by the way, things like the NFL Network are not doing tremendously well. There are other collegiate networks out there that aren't doing tremendously well because those are, those are, those are essentially pay-per-view options, right? You're paying for that content by way of your subscription to Comcast Cable, right? So, so if, if Root's gonna pay for high school content, if ESPN's gonna pay for high school content, they're only gonna do that if there is something someone to pass those costs on to, and that's you and me in subscriptions. So I get, you know, the business answer is, is that if there are enough people willing to shoulder the cost of those rights fees via their subscriptions and pay to watch, then, then there's a business model there. But there has to be an audience willing to pay for the content. In my opinion, that might be a little bit more difficult uh, in the Northwest as opposed to if uh, Root was operating more in the south or in Texas where the biggest building in uh, a city will be its high school football stadium. So uh, that's my two cents. <laughs> Okay. 